Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Reed Fishler, Michelle Sergio, and Mike McLaughlin. Coming up on DTNS, has cryptocurrency helped Russians avoid sanctions? How COVID in China is affecting chip supplies? And the NBA goes volumetric on ESPN. This is the Daily Tech News for March 16th. It's a Wednesday. Wednesday, March 16th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. Coming in hot from north of the wall, I'm Amos. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Sarah Lane has the day off, but we are full of tech news. Bursting. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Norton's LifeLock purchase of cybersecurity company Avast is under investigation by the United Kingdom's Competition and Markets Authority over the deal possibly harming competition and giving British customers a possibly worse deal. The CMA called on the companies to submit proposals about the concerns or face an in-depth probe. Norton LifeLock said the investigation will delay the completion of an $8.6 billion deal, which was previously expected to close on April 4th or sometime mid-late 2022 now. Axios reports Slack cut off access to some customers in Russia uh, to comply with the international sanctions, as well as policies from parent company Salesforce, which will exit business in Russia. Several directly sanctioned organizations were locked out of accounts without notice and were therefore unable to download any data before the shutdown. The company told Axios in a statement, quote, Slack is required to take action to comply with sanctions regulated in the U.S. and other countries where we operate, including in some circumstances suspending accounts without prior notice, as mandated by law, unquote. Samsung CEO J.H. Han bowed in apology in front of shareholders for the controversy over Galaxy S22 phones performance throttling using the Game Optimization Service app. If you don't realize, that's a big deal. Uh, following a software update last week, the app can now prioritize performance. You get a little more control, though you cannot remove it. South Korea's Fair Trade Commission has already launched an investigation uh, into whether Samsung violated fair labeling and advertisement laws by overpromising capabilities of the Galaxy S22. Miso Robotics announced a trial with Chipotle for Chippy, a robot able to follow the steps for frying Chipotle chips. Uh, the test is currently in an R&D facility with deployment at a Southern California restaurant scheduled for, or scheduled for later this year. Miso also has a deal with White Castle for bringing its Flippy 2 burger frying robot to 100 locations. Miso hungry. <laughs> uh, Meta announced Family Center, a hub of safety tools to try to protect young users, which parents can use to control what kids see and do across Meta's apps, beginning with Instagram. The tool will be available in Meta's VR platform in May, and on the rest of the company's offerings like Facebook in the coming months. Supervision feature lets parents monitor how much time a child spends on an app, accounts recently followed, and notifications about any reported accounts. Right now, teens can access the tools from their own account, and the ability for parents to turn on supervision mode will come in June. All right, let's talk about Meta, because Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg was talking at South by Southwest. Are you ready to hear what Meta has to say about NFTs, Scott? I am. I'm. If anyone's going to tell me about NFTs, surely it's Mark Zuckerberg and Meta. Yeah, never a more 2022 sentence was spoken. Uh, <laughs> NFTs are coming to Instagram, quote, in the near term, uh, though Zuckerberg did not provide specific details, only that over the next several months, the ability to bring some of your NFTs in and hopefully over time be able to mint things within the environment is coming. Instagram head Anna Mosseri previously said the company was actively exploring NFT technology. Zuckerberg also said NFTs could be part of the metaverse, whatever that ends up being, uh, adding, quote, the clothing that your avatar is wearing in the metaverse, you know, can be basically minted as an NFT and you can take it between your different places, whatever those places are. And assuming they all cooperate on a standard for how to honor what the NFT says the clothing is, uh, which is why he also said technical issues need to be worked out first. And if you don't like this, well, you just don't care about the future, apparently, because Zuckerberg also said, quote, I think on some level, the future sort of belongs to the people who believe in it more than others. I just think we care more. You know, I think we're the company that cares about helping people connect. Scott, they just, it's so much caring. Uh, he also said use cases for the metaverse uh, include gaming, productivity, and fitness. 
That actually makes sense to me. Uh, and that we're a few years away, few years away from augmented reality glasses that are truly augmented reality and look like glasses. Yeah, aren't giant things on your head. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm going to surprise a couple of people here with this take. Uh, I actually think Instagram in particular, and maybe Meta at large, but Instagram in particular is really well suited to be a transition point of access for NFT creation. And I, I believe this for a couple of reasons. I think Zuckerberg's talking a lot of nonsense as well. But Instagram is already much to the chagrin of the founders ideas about it being only a photo site it's a place for artists to go show their stuff that's where we go the biggest artists i follow they mm -hmm. have the biggest followings and the most stuff happening on instagram so instagram has become a gallery of sorts for artists and uh, a very serious one and so if you're going to have a legitimate mechanism to take your your art and convert it to nfts and that being an entry point for it i actually think this is a really good step forward I think yeah. there's a platform that will benefit from this. And I think that we'll benefit from the fact that it's a legitimate, regardless of how you feel about meta or other issues with Facebook, a legitimate entry point that is a little bit more mainstream trustworthy because you know the name, it's been around forever, and it's a big spotlight on a company like that. They're not gonna, they're not gonna be a, a scam ridden nightmare, at least, you know, we hope not. And I feel like as an artist, somebody who does this already, a big part of my living is made doing this. This might be my entry point. So I'm actually kind of all for this. Now, whether or not it's, and then take it to the next space or place and all these things he talks about and whether you believe in it or not, forget all that. Um, if we're just looking for practicality and NFTs, this might be the, the one or at least one of the first I've seen that actually has me excited. It almost sounds like you care about the future, Scott. I think I do. I think I believe in the future. I just don't believe. I used to think children were the future, but now I think NFTs of children are the future. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, all kidding aside. Uh, if you hate NFTs, you hate NFTs, and none of this is going to change your mind about it. I get that. And if you're like super NFT excited, uh, I actually don't think this changes your excitement either, no. but you're right there in the middle. And I think that's what is interesting about this is a trusted platform is what's missing in NFT. OpenSea looked like it might become that. And then people started finding that they were not as good at scaling up their enforcement as you might have wanted them to be to fight fraud and abuse. And that's the problem with NFTs is people taking your stuff and putting it on a platform and profiting from it without your approval, which you just need good enforcement to do. We've already seen retail platforms do that with physical goods. It needed to happen with NFTs. It does need to happen. So I get what you're saying. Maybe Instagram becomes that trusted platform when it comes to NFTs. And it, and and you, I think you made the point very well. It's a natural thing for the art and photo part of this, right? Because you already go there. And I can absolutely see people making an Instagram photo. It gets really popular. And if there's minting in there saying, oh, well, we'll mint that and somebody can own the NFT of it now. Yeah, my experience has been the people that are the most excited about NFTs are not actually artists. They're people that want to trade in NFTs. They want to make money. They want to do some cool ideas, and it's fine, whatever. They're the ones that are the most stoked. On the other end, you have people just hate it to hate it, and that's fine for them too. I'm not interested in either of those extremes at the moment. What I'm interested in is, like you said, this middle space, mostly made of artists. We have a lot of concerns, and I think rightly so, and we're looking for the, these channels to kind of clear up. And it feels like maybe this is it. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about chips. COVID-19 infections are spreading through China, which up until now pursued a zero COVID policy, uh, which means that it did very well through most of the pandemic, but its populace has less exposure and the more transmissible Omicron variant is spreading fast. In response to this, China has been locking down and that has affected the city of Shenzhen, where a large portion of China's tech companies operate, including Foxconn, one of the world's biggest, MediaTek and TSMC being other huge ones. Foxconn gets outsized attention sometimes because it makes chips for Apple, and it's a player. While Foxconn has operations all over the world, they have them in India and Brazil and Mexico, Malaysia, Taiwan, and elsewhere, it makes a significant number of its chips in Shenzhen. So when it had to pause operations there Monday, that was a blow to the prospects of the chip shortage easing, especially because officials said originally that the lockdown would last at least a week, ending March 20th at the earliest. However, on Wednesday, today as we're recording this, 
Foxconn says it has restarted operations, not full, but limited operations, after meeting government conditions for staff to live and work on campus in a closed loop. Uh, China has done this before, most famously with the Beijing Olympics this year, uh, having a closed loop situation. So they're doing that for Foxconn. Additionally, production can be shifted elsewhere in the company. The Henan factory is not shut down for Foxconn, and that makes 50% of the iPhones that Foxconn assembles. Uh, Foxconn also had an earnings call where Chairman Liu Youngwei made some remarks that may or may not make you feel better. On the bad side, he said, the pandemic has not eased, inflation is high, and Global politics are getting tense. These all further complicate supply and demand and lead to great uncertainty to our outlook. Uh, so that sounds pretty doom and gloom. But he also said he was cautiously positive and said the war in Ukraine would have limited impact on Foxconn's business because Russia and Ukraine are not the company's main sources of raw materials, specifically nickel and neon, which we've talked about uh come out of Russia and Ukraine in, in large amounts. So Foxconn feels like they're okay. That's good news to see them specifically saying that. Of course, Foxconn isn't the only chip maker in Shenzhen. The lockdown has also affected touch panel maker GIS, chip packager and tester GAM services. Uh, so it's too early to tell if this is going to have a lasting effect or not. But reading between the lines here, Scott, it feels to me like Foxconn is not preparing their shareholders for a really bad rest of the year because of this. They they think they're going to be able to weather it fine. Yeah, absolutely. They're giving themselves a bit of an out. Uh not really an out, but by saying they're they're optimistic or they're cautiously positive is the actual phrasing is a is a great way to say, I mean, who knows, but we feel pretty good and that's usually an okay thing to say to shareholders and we'll at least give them some confidence. Um we talked about this a bit this morning on on our TMS segment, and it reminded me of the two weeks I spent in Shenzhen back in the early 2000s. And we were there to visit factories and to inspect processes and all this stuff for the company I worked for at the time. And it, it struck me then, uh, and this was post SARS, the big SARS breakout in China, that part of China as well, southern China, that they kind of had closed loop systems already there when we got there. And the way it worked is people lived in basically, I don't know if makeshift's the right word, but campuses that were built into the factory as part of the campus. And they literally would just out the door, down the hall, you're at work, down the hall, back home. And they, at the time they were talking about how they were gonna make that kind of standard. Now this is some, you know, 18 years ago or something. So I'm, I'm sure things have changed, evolved and who knows where they are now, but it seems like if anything, Foxconn and others in that region are more suited to do this closed loop that you described than almost any other manufacturing in the world. Yeah. And and because of that, uh, and because of the fact that it's right now just Shenzhen and and they have factories in other places in the world, uh, Foxconn is thinking, we'll be fine. They really did seem to not think that the war in Ukraine is going to be a material impact at all, which has been my worry is that just as we're finally getting supplies to even out, right? We're finally getting demand is settling into a more predictable pattern. One of the biggest causes of the chip shortage was unpredictable demand. We thought it would be zero and it was way higher than we thought. And that threw everything out of whack uh, in addition to weather and pandemic related stuff. So demand seems to be finally coming into a more predictable pattern. Uh, the war could have thrown the logistics out of whack. It's certainly going to have an effect, but it sounds like at least for Foxconn, they don't feel that that will be as big of a problem. So there's still hope for them on being able to get back to meeting their chip demand. Well, Netflix made a post on its website Wednesday called paying to share Netflix outside your household. This is not nearly as bad as you would think just from reading that headline. They're launching two new features as a test in three countries, Chile, Costa Rica, and Peru. Uh, the first feature is called Add an Extra Member. It lets anybody who has a standard or premium account, so not the basic account, but the top two accounts, add up to two people to their subscription for around $3 a month extra. It's all in local currency. Although for Costa Rica, that is in fact $2.99 because they use the dollar. Uh, but it's around $3 equivalent per person. So that's way cheaper than forcing that person to go get their own account. The idea being here is those people get their own logins and passwords, but you only have to pay $3 extra to make them legit if they're not in your household. The other new feature is called transfer profile to new account. 
basic standard and premium subscribers can take advantage of this one. It lets people migrate their profile and their recommendations and view history to a new account. So if you're going legit, you don't lose all that view history, which has been an impediment to some people like, you know, I would like to pay for my own Netflix account, but then I'm going to lose all my recommendations. So that includes the extra member accounts as well. If you're adding someone with their own login password, they're going to keep their profile. This is all a very soft way to encourage folks to start paying for their own accounts if they don't live in the same household. It's cheaper in the uh, add an extra member than getting your own account. You can keep your history. Netflix has been testing all kinds of ways of notifying people if it thinks they're not on their own account. And those notifications have been very soft as well. Uh, they come with an option to just ignore it. Uh, Netflix has not taken to forcing people off accounts. In fact, even if it detects something odd, it gives the option to verify later. So Netflix is trying to softly encourage people to start paying for their own subscriptions in what I think is the nicest way possible if you're going to do it at all. The only thing nicer would be not to do it. I agree. I also think it's effective. Um, I have always said that the thing that gets people away from sharing passwords all the way down to more nefarious stuff like sharing BitTorrents and, you know, getting into real piracy uh, is making it convenient and affordable to switch and make it more legit. And it feels like these are good softball ways of encouraging people to do that. And uh, as somebody who has a whole bunch of shows in various states of watching uh, with a with a cursor or a scrubber right in the middle of a show or right at the end of a movie, and I intend to get back to those things, it would be really nice to know if I was in this situation that those things would move forward. As it is right now, I am somebody who shares a password with my daughter who does not live here, and we don't even think about it. We don't even think of it as being a, a weird deal. We're just like, oh yeah, well it's my kids. They're gonna, you know, we're all gonna watch the the thing together. Um, it's nice to know that she has a way to a either inexpensively bump it up or b have a good transition to her full account. I think we're probably going to do this with her. I mean, it makes sense to me. And I think that they can't be in the business of raising prices and doing so kind of controversially and being hard nosed about this. So I think it's very smart that they're being for lack of a better way of saying it soft nosed about it. Because if they're being hard nosed about it, you would have a lot of pushback from people saying, well, I already paid 20 something bucks for this thing. I'm not, I may as well cancel if this is how it's going to be. Like I could see the uproar and I think they may be avoiding the uproar here pretty well. I like it. Amos, you have a legitimate reason to be using Netflix in two different households. Right. Because we, we have a shared household where we, well, not shared, but split household where half the family lives down in Washington and half of them live up here in, in Alaska. And we all have our profiles and everything else. And we like legitimately transfer between like the twins are here right now. They're about ready to go down to Washington for a while. Uh, I'll be going down there this summer. And, you know, we, we share households. It's, it's, and to be clear, y'all are married. This is not a like, well, we split up, but we're living in two different places. Right. right? No, we yeah. are, we are, yeah, very actively. You, you married. just have jobs in two different locations. That's all. right. We're separated because of employment. And the twins are going to college down there. And that's one of the reasons my wife took that job. Um, but we, you know, it's nice to know that if they do want to crack down and they if they do decide, hey, this is not a legitimate way to use the service as we feel it is, um, at least there is an out. There's a, a soft way out. The, you know, the kid, the twins could transfer their profiles over or whatever. But to know that they're not taking the hard nose uh, view on it, like Scott was saying, that really adds a little bit of security. And I know it's it's a minor effect here, but it's just one less thing to worry about that Netflix is going to just force us to cancel and reestablish and we're going to lose all of our history and everything else. It's really the perfect solution for how we live if they do want to take that next step. But by the sounds of this, we're good. Do you think this will spread like uh, next thing you know, HBO Max and Disney Plus and everybody else? Well, no, I don't. Because I, I don't either. Yeah. But again, the same those thing. Those companies there. are more worried with, with the shareholders and the bottom line, say, and, and the distributors and, and the, this paranoia of like every account without paying is a lost dollar. Whereas Netflix is like, we understand that we don't want to go to war with our pot, with our customers. Mm, right. And right. with those services, again, we split those, like those are all on the same account and we share those between the two houses because it's all the same family. We're all still living together. We just have 
two separate locations in which we live from t- you know depending on I mean, what, both what of these solutions like. really show that they understand their audience i think you both have made the point well that you know letting you move your profile just takes away an impediment right it's like let's make it easy for you to get your own account adding the separate login as an extra three bucks is a great way to get rid of one of the other things which is like uh I would get my own Netflix account, but I can't afford it. But I hate that I have to log in with my dad's password because he keeps changing it yep. and blah, blah, blah. This way you you get control, which then will eventually make you just be like, you know what? I might as well just pay for my own eventually. I, and they're monetizing at $3 people that they wouldn't get money out of at all, right? right. Which is $3 more than they would have got. Now, is this going to add to the number of simultaneous streams that you can have, or is it? No, it doesn't. Okay. I, I well, at least it doesn't say it does. Right, because that that's one of the things we we do have the premium accounts. So we can mm-hmm. have maximum streams because we do have, you know, a couple of people here at the house. In and that's your way to it. kick people like, well, then maybe you should just get your own account. <laughs> right, right. You know, that's exactly spe- right. especially if you're on the premium to get those extra logins, yep. you know, yep. simultaneous streams. Maybe you know that that's. I think it's really smart. I think Netflix is doing the right thing by its customers here. Well, folks, uh, what do you think? If you're like, no, you're all wrong. Netflix is horrible. Uh, You could say that or you could say something nice in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. When the war in Ukraine began and sanctions were levied against people in Russia, there were a lot of theories about what role cryptocurrency might play. After several weeks, we have some evidence to look at. The Economist did a great job at looking at how all of this is going so far. It appears that it may be more useful for Ukraine than Russia, but it's not a panacea for either one. With a traditional bank, your transactions are private, but your identity is not. That's why sanctions work with banks. They're like, oh, sanctions against this person? Great, we'll block transactions from that person. With cryptocurrencies, your identity can be private, but your transactions are not because everything's out there on the public blockchain. And in fact, if you use an exchange, then they know who you are too. So it's neither private. The predictions of some were that people in Russia would get around sanctions by using cryptocurrency and Russian crypto activity has definitely risen. Ruble to Bitcoin volumes on Binance have risen by about 10 times since the war began. Bitcoin is pretty stable in value right now, while the ruble has plunged 40% against the dollar since February 24th. So what's happening here is people are moving their rubles into crypto to preserve the value because Bitcoin is more stable than the ruble. But most places don't let you pay with crypto, meaning if you want to use that preserved money, you have to exchange it for another currency like dollars. And to do that, you at least need a crypto exchange and probably need to involve a bank at some point. Most banks that would be useful are honoring sanctions, as are big exchanges like Binance and Coinbase. Of course, you just use your own wallet and move your crypto around without anybody uh, having to be involved. Uh, But even then, don't forget your transactions are public. And because some wallet IDs are known, government investigators have gotten much better at being able to deduce, even if they don't know your wallet ID, if they know the wallet ID that you're sending stuff to, they can figure out who's behind an otherwise anonymous wallet. Remember we had Laura Shin on the show, February 22nd, describing how you can trace back identities of folks. And in December, the FBI used these kinds of methods to get back $3.6 billion worth of crypto stolen from an exchange back in 2016. So... Because of the public nature of the ledger, cryptocurrencies have not been a big help in avoiding sanctions. The public nature is not a problem for the government of Ukraine, though. It published its wallet address right there on Twitter and has received more than $100 million worth of donations, which you can see on the blockchain. In addition, some companies that don't normally take cryptocurrencies as payment have been making an exception for the government of Ukraine. Crypto transactions also can happen almost instantly, compared to the days it takes for bank transfers, which speeds things up, which is kind of important when you're being bombed. Still, $100 million is not a lot. Uh, The United States just today approved $800 million of aid, uh, and they've given billions over the the past couple months. Uh, Europe has as well. So even though this is working for Ukraine, I'm not sure that it's a big percentage of, of what's working. Every little bit helps, of course. Doesn't it seem... Okay, forgive me if this is oversimplification, but for the first time in the crypto world, it feels like its presence turned out to be kind of a lucky thing in this moment. Uh, by that, I just mean, and, and you're right about it not being huge amounts, but 
it's something, right? And prior to crypto's adoption, at least in a broader sense, you, none of this would have been possible. You just would have shut down local currencies and everything would have been very, you know, back alley, black markety sort of uh, transactions of any kind. And I don't know, is it a happy accident that we happen to be, or I guess what I'm saying is, is this showing the potential of, of cryptocurrency in times of need? And are we, are we, are we able to see it? I at least feel like I'm being able to see it in a slightly different light as a less of a, of a, of a speculation market and less of an investment market and all the ups and downs and actually see it as a safe guard. <laughs> go bad, I, I think what, what it, what it, I think you're, you're onto it, right? Which is, it is showing what cryptocurrency is and is not good for. And a lot of the uh, conclusions that people jumped to aren't correct. Uh, it's not great for hiding everything. It certainly is good for hiding some things. People use it to great effect to launder money uh, here and there. I'm not saying it, it isn't, but it's not a panacea for, for hiding your transactions, especially if you need to use a bank. Now, someday you might argue cryptocurrency will be accepted in more places, in which case that need to get to the banks won't be an issue. Mm -hmm. But then at that point, exchanges may be the bottleneck. Exchanges may be able to, to step in and, and, and enforce sanctions and things like that. So I, I think these things are always a little bit less bad and a little bit less good than you think. And I, I, to me, that's what we're seeing is like, they are of limited usefulness. I'm not sure if they make a difference or not, but every little bit helps, like I said. And they certainly aren't like this horrible thing that's engendering uh, people to get around rules. Yeah, I guess what it, it strikes me is just similar to things, not quite the same, obviously, but it's like the ubiquity of cameras, uh, the internet itself. Yeah, yeah. Those kinds of things all are here and they were here as they got here and we've used it for all the reasons we've used it. But it's really nice to have it during a time where in historical terms, it would be that much more devastating with without some of these tools. And it feels deep, like deep fakes is another example here where where everybody's like, oh, with deep fakes now, uh, you won't be able to believe anything you see. And it has not turned out to be true. Uh, deep fakes are fairly quickly exposed as deep fakes, even now. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Uh, this is not going to be a deep fake as far as I know, but Wednesday's upcoming NBA matchup between the Dallas Mavericks and Brooklyn Nets will be broadcast on ESPN in 3D volumetric video. First time an entire full game has been done in volumetric video. Uh, ESPN Edge, Disney Media and Entertainment Distribution's technology team, which used to be easier to say because it used to be BAM Tech. It's the BAM Tech folks uh, have teamed up with the NBA and Canon, who's providing the cameras. Canon will use its free viewpoint video or FVV system with over 100 data capture cameras positioned around the basketball court to create a live sports broadcast merged with multi-dimensional footage, something that looks very much like you're watching a video game because it'll be able to just move around like, like, like you're riding on a little drone. Uh, the Brooklyn Nets have already used dimensional footage for replay clips and post-production content with the Yes Network, uh, but this is the first time it's been done in a full game, and they are the only team from any of the four major U.S. pro leagues to utilize that system. I think this is rad, and I have a couple of reasons why. Number one, I actually think it looks really cool. Even the test footage, to me, looks cool. Um, there's a game equality to it. And I don't mean like bad meat. I mean like, like you know, uh, video gamey. There's a little bit of a, a, a graphical tell there that kind of makes it look like a video game or a, a kind of a high-end modern basketball game from 2K or somebody. They have the big games every year. Um, but it then hit me. I think the coolest thing about this is it's purely selfish for the game reason, but game developers to get uh, and when they get the NBA license and the players license, they go and they get everybody mo capped, everybody on every team except maybe some of the deep bench. But most of the big players, they get mo capped, face capped, playing fake basketball. That's how they get it. They don't do real games with all these rigs on and all this motion capture on. This represents potentially, and I don't know who owns the patents and who has to pay who, but it potentially has the ability to change the way that stuff's captured. And literally you could just say, all right, well, we did, we watched the, uh, the Mavericks game and now we have everything we ever need for any kind of Mavericks mocap 
because we have all of this player data just yeah. from that that broadcast. You might still need to do a little bit of traditional mocap, right? But but this this could take could make that process way shorter. Way, way shorter. And the concept is that this is not restricted to any one angle. You can zoom in as far or as far away or as close as you want. And I know I'm not talking about fidelity here. I'm just saying you can take that camera from way up here, skylight, and go all the way down and look right into the face of your favorite player and see what expression he's making when he missed that free throw. That's the data they need. And I, I'm almost convinced of this. I've talked to some friends who do a lot of mocap, and I have a few that do. But um, this feels like huge, for, for lack of, you know, I don't like to use the word game changer. We're talking about a game, but this is a game changer for that kind of mocap. It's not going to apply to everything, but it could expand to like action sequences, big armies rushing over a hill, like turning all of that into polygonal, uh, you know, posable data. That's massive. So I'm I'm excited yeah. about this for, for sports, but I'm maybe more excited about other uses. Would you say it's a slam dunk? I'm going to call it a slam dunk. No, you know what? I'm going to say it's a three pointer from downtown. <laughs> okay, very good. Well done. Uh, thank you, Scott Johnson. Uh, before we get out of here, what do you got going on to tell folks about? Well, speaking of video games, um, I have a show now called Play Retro, which is a show all about old games. Uh, and when I say old, it could be even stuff in the 2000s, but games that we think of as yesteryear, lots of pixelated stuff, 16-bit, 8-bit, that sort of thing. And uh, we just did a big, deep dive, my co-host Brian Dunaway and I, on the, the uh, Metroid series, from Metroid 1 all the way back on the NES up to uh, what we played today, like with Metroid Dread on last year's title for the Switch. If that sounds interesting to you, you want to hear all the crazy stories about its creation, and why it's such a venerable part of gaming history, check out Play Retro wherever you get your shows. If you need it all in one place, you can find it at frogpants.com slash play retro. We need eight new patrons, and it would be worse if it weren't for Corey, Steve, and James. We had three people had to drop off for various reasons, but Corey, Steven, and James stepped in to fill the gap. It could be you next. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Steven. Thank you, James. And uh, patrons get a longer version of this show that's going to keep going right now called Good Day Internet. You can get that at patreon.com slash DTNS. However, if you don't get that, uh, we say goodbye. We're live Monday through Friday, though. You can watch us there, too, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2800 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow, Len Peralta will be illustrating, and Justin Robert Young will be pontificating in the best way. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>